Um, and there we go. Since this is a public session, I'm recording it um, out there so that folks have the, the public reference for it. Um, the uh, When we do get uh, to uh, parts where it is a bit more participatory, uh, don't worry, we will pause the recording um, just to make sure that it's as collaborative as possible. Um, for any stuff that you do learn here today, remember that it is Chatham House Rules. Um, so anything like, hey, Chris said this, great, fine, a tribute for the person on stage. Uh, but otherwise, uh, feel free to make sure that you walk away with the learnings. Feel free to share and talk about the learnings. Uh, just keep it uh, confidential here, um, who you might have heard it from, because again, the important part are the learnings, how we're able to help it, each other advance on this. So without further ado, we'll dive right in here um, to uh, our conversation. Uh, so the starting activity that we have, um, and we'll actually be dropping some links here in the chat um, around the, the canvases that we're going to be walking through. And so these will be PDFs um, that you can look at, um, that you can download right now, you can have saved on your desktop for um, use over the course of the conversation. Um, uh, sharing them with you now, recognizing they might be a distraction, uh, but want to make sure that if you do come up with an interesting idea along the way as the course of our conversation goes, that you can flag those and note those for your own reference. Uh, we do, again, have some participatory stuff that's coming up, and we want to make sure that you are engaging and sharing there because other people will learn from uh, the ideas that you have. So do make sure that you're sharing back in with the group, uh, but want to make sure to share these in advance. Everyone will also get a copy um, who registered, benefits of registering. Um, you'll get a copy of this deck um, so that you have all the links that are referenced throughout it. Um, if you're watching this later and didn't attend or participate, don't worry, you can find this with a little bit of digging from uh, Donut Economics Action Lab. If you can't find it, let me know. Um, but again, for those who registered today, we will be making sure that we share out the deck with all the links in it. The key activity here for step one um, is really looking at transformative ideas, right? So if you, um, for what you know about Donut Economics, we'll get into that in a minute, um, and the ambitions for business. The, the intent is to really identify what is something that your business is, is not yet pursuing, something, a big, hairy, audacious goal, right? What the strategic thinking that really pushes the boundaries. We're not talking about incremental change. We're talking about really transformative change. Um, that's what we want to identify in the first step. So we need to suspend reality a little bit. Don't worry. We will, in, in step two, get back into, all right, if that's where we want to get to, what are the things that we need to tweak, that we need to change in order to get there? And so we will re-anchor ourselves a bit further in reality. Uh, my intent would be to get through steps one and two today. And then in February, we can even ground it a bit further um, in baking that into reality and making business plans and strategies around that. So um, I should see some stuff uh, in the chats um, for some of these links, but again, more uh, to come in the follow-up. For those who did not see the primer, uh, the high-level overview uh, on donut economics, right? It's uh, the basic idea of it is uh, we want to make sure that there is uh, no one left behind um, as society uh, continues to iterate, as we continue to uh, interact with each other in the economy, as we continue to, to work through all the poly crises that are layered on top of each other now. Um, so thinking about um, that societal floor that we've all collectively agreed to, that we all have a sense of like, yeah, this is fair. We don't really want anyone left behind. We don't want anyone falling below this. Um, and if you want examples of that, think about here locally in the region in middle America, any of the boom bust cycles that we've been through over the past four industrial re uh, industrial revolutions, right? Um, want to make sure that no one gets left behind in those efforts. At the same time, want to make sure that we're not exceeding any of the planetary boundaries, right? Uh, between those is that safe and just space for humanity to thrive. Now, uh, there is a lot of economic activity, just a lot of the way that um, the world is operating right now, where we are pushing beyond those boundaries on both sides, right? And so that's, that's a mismatch in economics, right, um, where the costs are not appropriately accounted for. And so that's really what the, the thinking around donut economics is, so that we bring those activities back within scale and operate in that safe and just space. So what does that mean for businesses? Because donut economics has been thought of and classified in, in terms of community at whatever scale you think of that community at, um, when you think about it from a business perspective, um, there are two different questions um, that you can be asking around um, what has been more of the norm 
as how much financial value can we extract from this enterprise? And we tend to accumulate wealth in a certain few hands um, and not necessarily with all those involved in co-creating that value. Um, it often tends to be very degenerative of the ecological assets that we have and the societal assets that we have. Um, so just running down um, the principles that we, uh, we have. More and more businesses are thinking it from the perspective of how many benefits can we generate uh, in the way we design this enterprise? And so that will be the focus of like, okay, if we want to get there, how do we get there, right? How do we get to a, a design that is regenerative, a design that is distributive of the value that we're co-creating together? And doing that again by design. So there are a couple of principles involved in that. Uh, again, uh, most folks have seen probably a, a bit around this as far as take, make, waste uh, versus a regenerative cycle that tends to put it back into use again in the natural biological cycles as well as the technical material cycle. You can also think about that from the human perspective as well, right? Um, the bigger piece um, that was more transformative for me, and I've heard more and more folks talking in these ways, um, is that we need to really go beyond sustainability. And that might seem really controversial to hear from a center for sustainable business to say we need to go beyond sustainability. Um, it's no longer enough to aim to be 100% less bad. We're, we're just past that point, right? We've, we've gone past too many boundaries um, an ecological ceiling and we've cut through too many um, floor and left, or are leaving too many people behind that if we just continued on that status quo or even just were less bad, we're continuing in a, in a bad place, right? So we need to shift and undo a lot of the, the damage that we all collectively have already done, right? So this isn't about a naming and shaming. This is a stuff's in the wrong place. We need to uh, course correct and all get back aligned together. Otherwise, this isn't going to be a good ship for any of us to be on. So that's you know, part of the regenerative aspect of thinking. And again, thinking from divisive to distributive, it's no longer really enough to just merely be inclusive to think about like, hey, great, how do we provide the minimum that people might need um, for just a, a basically decent life? How do you think about how do we scale that in a way um, that really helps share the value that everyone's contributing that they're helping co-create together, right? So. Uh, one example, if people uh, want a case study on this one, um, you can look at um, the outdoor clothing company Houdini and their circular design products. Um, so transformative ideas. Uh, it's We're going to take a page from Albert Einstein, right? It's uh, it's We have to think differently. The, the thinking that got us here, we can't use that to think our way out of it. Um, and so Donut Economics Actions Lab did uh, a lot of research um, with a number of different businesses and stakeholders and found that um, there were a number of things that were holding transformative ideas back, updated processes, financial uh, rigorous, rigid financial targets, sorry, not rigorous, rigid financial targets, uh, a variety of other points you see uh, on the screen. And then at the same time, um, what it took to unlock transformative ideas, there seem to be a fairly consistent set consistent set there as well. Um, and so that's really what we're gonna be focusing on is how do we shift uh, in there and how do we help uh, you develop those skills to identify those in the organizations that you've worked in. So this is where we're gonna start getting into our first little creative activity together. Um, so take a moment, I realize I have been spitfire talking really fast. And so slow down, pause, close your eyes, visualize, your ideal utopian economy, utopian world, maybe that's a Star Trek reference and thinking about you know uh, an ideal world in the Federation, but like wherever your ideal um, future economy is that's generative and distributed by design. Place your feet in there, feel the air, smell the grass. We're both feet rooted in that reality. Now imagine the business that you work in is part of that future economy. What are your most ambitious ideas for getting there? We're going to draw from a, a number of different places and a very different voices in order to maybe help tee up some ideas. You probably already had some initially come to you, but we're going to get to those here um, in a moment um, and sharing those ideas out. How we're going to do that, I'll throw open a Zoom 
whiteboard. We'll all use the fun little sticky notes, uh, like we would if we were in person, to talk around and look at what ideas may you have heard before from activists or local communities or future generations, even those that aren't born yet. Like, what will your grandchildren say or your great grandchildren say? Uh, maybe your customers or your employees, your value chain folks up or downstream of you are already talking about some things. Uh, you might have heard some stuff from some industry leaders or other experts. Maybe you have ideas or insights if you're just, you know, on a nature bath, out walking around and you see some ideas inspired by nature. Uh, maybe there's some stuff thinking about distributed by design or generated by design. There's some things that like maybe we should stop doing some of the things that we're doing right now, or maybe there's some things that we should start doing. Right. Um, so that's what we're going to be getting into here um, in a moment, just to help again get those ideas turning. Uh, some examples here from a, a goods company, somebody that makes things. Right. Um, they're thinking about uh, you know have ten-year supplier contracts with folks to, that focus on, that bake into those purchasing decisions so that societal outcomes, right? Um, they're looking at their factories actually sequestering carbon, not just being more efficient and emitting less, but actually sequestering carbon, right? They're looking at profit sharing with employees or that the water that they put back out is actually cleaner in all the different ways than the water they take in. Again, thinking regenerative, right? Um, from a professional services perspective, so now we have some of those uh, with us today as well, uh, thinking about, you know, hey, do we discontinue work with unethical clients? That's not clients that are earlier on in their journey. It's just the ones that are like, yeah, they're just not doing things. They're actually making a positive impact and they know it. And like, do we really want to be uh, supporting them? Um, uh, conversely, are you actually proactively promoting businesses uh, that have taken redesign? Um, are they a constituent class within your customer segment? Or like, are you prioritizing the customer group? Um, do you have lower fees for higher positive impact, right? How are you thinking about working through these different things? Um, so with that, go uh, stop that screen share and see if I can pull up this whiteboard, existing whiteboard. Okay. All right. So um, if this doesn't come up for everybody, let me know. Um, it should um, work out. Yeah, I already see some of our folks already over there. Adding in some stuff. So the idea in this one is that um, go ahead and take the stickies. Go ahead and throw in your ideas. Um, if you can, go ahead and add them around to the thing that inspired the idea. If anyone is having any trouble in this, um, let me know. Go pop the Zoom recording. There we go. All right. So I uh, went through there on that one. Thank you all for leaning in on that. Um, uh, again, the, the intent there is to visualize the future, right? Like what's possible? What, what could we be doing? What value could we really be adding out there? The, those big, carry audacious, transformative ideas, right? Um, the ideas should be challenging. They should go beyond what currently seems possible, right? Um, now to do that, we do, this is where we start winding back into having our feet a little bit closer to reality, right? So this is where we start looking at current business design. So in your current business design, there are a couple of different things um, and we're going to be looking at how do you identify specific changes in there, right? Um, what are some specific things that your business can do? And so, a number of folks probably had these ideas going through their head in advance, right? Um, you know, Donut Economics folks uh, at the Deal Action Lab, when they uh, were doing a lot of research for this, you know, they met uh, a former senior executive of a major footwear brand, um, told them that uh, the story of how they designed a lower price shoe uh, that would be affordable for millions of children who currently lack good quality footwear. So that's an unaddressed market, right? 
Um, the shoe would also be, a, be more durable um, as it could be extended to the child's uh, foot as it grew, uh, avoiding the need to replace it regularly, right? So that's both great ecologically um, as well as adds a whole lot of uh, societal uh, benefit value, right? Um, it would, was also going to be profitable for the company to do this, uh, providing with a margin for the business and allowing them to reach new customers uh, around the world who normally could not afford the products. Um, when the idea was pitched to the company though, however, it was declined because it didn't meet uh, some high margin um, standard requirements that they had just across the, the business, just carte blanche, hey, regardless of thing, regardless of, of idea, it has to meet this minimum standard. Uh, and so take your industry, take your innovation, take your barrier. That's a little bit of the, um, an example of that inflexibility, that rigidness in thinking um, that if we're trying to get to transformative ideas, what are the current things in place that are blocking those types of transformative ideas, right? Uh, that's where we're going to spend a bit of our uh, time focused on. What are the things that are blocking ideas and what changes could unlock those ideas? So many businesses, again, um, focus on, um, you know, uh, if they try and do these ideas, they're hampered in, in being able to implement most of them, right? So it's only really on the margins that most businesses are currently able to, to think about or currently are uh, participating in ways that are um, more regenerative by design, more distributed by design. Uh, if we look at other organizations across the world, uh, you know, charitable organizations, um, civic organizations, public organizations, right? They, they are not constrained in those ways, right? Um, and so, what is it about businesses uh, that we can change so that uh, we can pursue these more transformative ideas? Um, so that's where we're going to focus on is how to how to shift, how to redesign the business so it can play in that space, right? Now, um, there are a number of uh, different needs uh, we may need to recognize along this way uh, in order to transform. Uh, businesses, right? So to reinforce these and, and drive further on this ambition, uh, donut economics, uh, the tools there are really focusing on transforming the deep design of business. You'll see that coming up over and over again, this idea of the deep design of business, right? Not just some surface level, here's a tiny little process, but something that is deep about how the business itself operates. Uh, and so there are five layers um, that they look through. And again, kudos, uh, thank you uh, to Marjorie Kelly um, and her foundational work in, in pioneering in this space, looking at purpose, networks, governance, ownership, and finance. Uh, so reaching all these scales for um, transformation, not only of design of products, again, but the design of the business itself. So here we're gonna ask uh, in purpose to take these one by one, we ask you, three main questions. Why does the business exist? How is its purpose embedded in its operations, its products, its services? And is it willing to transform these operations, products, and services in pursuit of its business or in pursuit of its purpose? To give an example on that one, you know, look at the fashion industry. Um, is the purpose of a business in fashion to produce as much as possible, as quickly as possible, for as cheap as possible, and at the detriment and cost of you know um, those communities and those ecologies, as is the case in you know say fast fashion, uh, or can we create high quality garments from natural fibers and distribute the value to those who make the garments in you know such as in the case of Manos uh, del Uruguay uh, owned by women artisans spread across the country. Thinking about networks, right? Um, is there uh, the relationships, uh, about the relationships uh, uh, with customers, with suppliers, with staff, communities, partners, right? So what are those the nature of those relationships? Um, are value chains made up of commodified relationships where there is no commitment to the suppliers or the distributors? Um, or does it take long term, do those relationships take long term commitments um, into mind uh, with those stakeholders uh, across the value chain? 
you know, when exploring the design of business, we also ask about the relationship with business, or sorry, the relationship with governments. Um, is it trying to avoid tax and avoid, and is it proactively lobbying against regulations and um, progressive action or part of organizations that are? Um, or is it paying a fair tax and joining business networks advocating for ambitious uh, public action on ecological and societal issues? As an example of that, you know, consider uh, a business, um, if a business truly commits to partnerships with suppliers and supporting them with orders and financial flexibility, even during crisis, which we've got plenty of these days, uh, like the German brand uh, and distributor El Puente, uh, which gives a board seat and co-ownership to its suppliers. Next, look at governance, right? Uh, to evaluate uh, the design of governance of businesses, we ask questions like, which stakeholders are represented on the board and which should be? Um, which, uh, you know, how does, how is decision-making, how do decision-making processes navigate trade-offs between social, ecological, and financial goals and how transparent is the business in that process? Um, thinking about the design of the board, decision-making processes, metrics of success, those are all design choices um, that are made by every business and can affect what is either blocking or unlocking your transformative actions. So take it as an example here, maybe uh, the board model of River Simple, a hydrogen car company based in Wales. So its board has a future, guard future guardian governance model that includes six custodians on the board of directors, representing the interests uh, from perspectives of stakeholders like environment, customers, community, staff, investors, and commercial partners. This fundamentally shapes how priorities are set and difficult decisions are made on that board. Fourth layer, ownership. Right, here we look at who owns the business, their commitment to the purpose, how long-term their, uh, their ownership interest is for, and to what extent the owners can change or undermine the purpose of the business. We'll look at the stakeholders who are represented in that ownership mix. Uh, we ask how the expectations of owners shape decisions, for instance, on ecological, societal, and financial performance. There are many emerging possibilities in ownership design uh, that are being pioneered out in the world, um, from you know, platform co-ops, employee ownership, um, community co-owned businesses, uh, broad range of hybrids and multi-stakeholder models, uh, and redesigning ownership uh, in these ways uh, is absolutely pivotal. And we have a couple of links on those that we can uh, drop into the chat as well. We get a lot of it linked um, here in the final deck that'll go out. Um, there are you know, examples on this front, one being that you probably all heard about, Patagonia which has uh, proclaimed Earth as its sole shareholder, right? So thinking about Patagonia, they deployed a steward model to create two classes of shares in its ownership redesign. I know when we start talking shares and ownerships, some of my audience is gonna zone out here for a minute, but just hold with me. I'll make sure to, to not, keep, get, not get too wonky in this. Um, one of those ownership classes um, was, had all dividend rights and none of the voting rights. So while they would get the profits, um, the, this redesign means that the share, this share class cannot pressure Patagonia to increase what those dividends were at any one point in time or what the profits were at any one point in time. The second share class gets all of the voting rights, but none of the dividends. This share class, which is the Patagonia Purpose Trust, is not focused on iteratively, consistently, constantly increasing profits, um, rather, meaning it's focused on being a steward of Patagonia's social and ecological purpose and the use of its power in its voting shares accordingly, right? So uh, profits, net income uh, is a necessity for all organizations. So it still has to maintain uh, that going concern and it's not overly fixated on it to the detriment of the other decisions that it's making, right? And here, uh, in essence, through the stewardship ownership model, Patagonia separated its power and money in that model. Right? So if you're a decision maker within Patagonia after this ownership decision, it's now even clearer 
that the priority is the purpose and there's no pressure to keep fixated on the dividends or on whatever type of profit target. And this can, again, unlock different levels of ambitions and possibilities. Final layer um, to get into here uh, quickly is finance. Uh, so, and I know I have uh, a number of folks from uh, business schools uh, and others who have backgrounds in finance, so looking forward to folks digging in on this one. Um, so looking at business through the perspective of donut economics poses questions like, what does the finance behind the business expect and demand? Do margin requirements adapt to enable transformative ideas? Is reinvestment enabled through mechanisms like, for instance, a cap on dividends? Um, and you know, whether investors receive a fair return, but the priority is for finance to serve the purpose, right? Like how do you balance these things? Um, so as we showed um, for examples in a variety of other ones, these are some of the things that help really hone in um, on those, uh, being able to unlock a distributive and regenerative business by design, right? So to put that in example, you know, the body shop, uh, entered into partnership with the social enterprise Plastics for Change. And that partnership created the world's first large scale fair trade recycled plastic, uh, achieving improved and more stable livelihoods for the waste pickers in India uh, to who collect the waste. Now to make the partnership work, the financial parameters were adapted to consider broader perceptions of value going beyond the focus of the immediate financial return. Um, and to the willingness to go beyond those margins and um, the costs that were unlocked, uh, unlocked the needed commitment uh, and investment from Body Shop in order to make this partnership work. So again, how do we flex different these different layers of the business in order to enable these transformative ideas? Now, uh, a word about law. Uh, I would be remiss as a JD if I didn't talk about the thing that I ended up doing some of my own research on in my own time in law school. Uh, just as a friend who's gone to law school, not a practicing attorney, um, and based on the experience of the folks over at Donut Economics, Lab, Donut Economics Action Lab, these can be important conversations to be in, and we can have a whole separate conversation about those. For what we're talking about today, unlocking these transformative ideas, the legal form was not seen as a preemptive barrier for that um, in the way that the other aspects were that we talked about, right? Um, so we can spend more time on these in the future. Uh, just wanted to, to note that that thought had been there. Um, so we talked a lot about these uh, layers of deep design of business. And again, um, there are many reasons why you may want to redesign a business as listed here. Um, the most important is to redesign businesses so that they become regenerative and distributive by design. So this is where we get to the exciting part of step two. Um, identifying, unlocking things. We're going to walk through what are some of the things, the blockers in each of these layers and in, in organizations that you work in. What are some um, steps that you can take to unlock your most transformative idea? Note that you don't need to come up with um, something in each of these layers for your business. If you happen to, that's great. That gives you more options to work with, more levers that you might be able to pull. Um, and when you're thinking about it, um, here's a, a quick, if anybody needs a, a quick recap, uh, but again, uh, the intent in there is to think about ideas uh, on each side. We'll go through these one by one. So we're gonna take first some red sticky notes, line them up on the side of what are the blockers. We're gonna take some blue sticky notes, Line them up on the side of those that are unlocking some transformative ideas. And then at the end, we're going to um, ask each of you, identify what's one action that you could take that um, would help you begin your donut economics business design journey. Uh, so it'll look something like this. To give you some examples of what others have come up with, right? Um, you know. Uh, going back to those goods examples, only investors represented on the board, no voice of uh, impacted stakeholders, to switching that over to employees and main suppliers represented on the board, right? Um, Long-term commitments, short-term commitments, right? Margins and dividends, things like that, right? Uh, thinking of it from the professional services company version, right? Um, have examples there as well. Uh, again, thinking of some type of profit fund as an internal fund, right? Um, 
in order to help clients that were actually doing more work on impact. I help funding more of those or, you know, thinking that the 10 highest impact clients um, who redesign their businesses for purpose become priority clients and you address those differently, right? Uh, thinking about, again, what are the things that are blocking your business? What are the things that you can do to unlock those transformative ideas in your business? So with that, I'm going to stop our little screen share. I'm going to pull up um, our whiteboard. Existing whiteboard. Da, 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 da. Right, and here we're going to flip over to page two. Hopefully everyone just came along with me when I did that. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and... All right. So uh, again, in our brief uh, sprints of conversation here today, uh, you know, we thought a bit about transformative ideas, thought about the, the deep design of your business, um, identified you know, one action that you could take to help unlock that, those most transformative ideas. Um, know that this is an iterative process. We're all going to keep learning as we go. Each of you will keep learning as you go. Your organization will keep learning as you go. Um, and we'll want to continually update and walk through this process as you go. Um, there are a couple of things. So to tee up, um, one, we did get as far as I was hoping to. Um, so hooray, kudos there. So that means um, in the next session in the uh, in February, uh, the fourth Thursday, 3 p.m., so February 22nd, uh, our next session, the part two around Donut Economics Action Lab tools is going to focus on some other stuff from their core tool, which is all around business plans, right? So we have some ideas on the kinds of change that we want to make. Uh, we'll put that out there for that. Um, there should be uh, the registration link um, out there in the chat right now. So if you want to go ahead and register, get that on your calendar. I realize this was a little last minute. Um, some of you had heard from the center in advance that this date was out there, but uh, I'm glad that we were able to pull it all together. You'll see a bit more here in advance of that next one. Um, I do want to make sure to uh, that we also share um, Donut Economic Action Lab's policy around using donut economics and donut design as it meets business. Um, so the, the key takeaway, the TLDR, too long, didn't read, uh, is there is no such thing as a uh, donut aligned business. There might be other frameworks or standards that you um, engage with out there to, to think about that. Um, this is not one of those. Um, there's a lot of academic and intellectual integrity uh, that uh, deal uh, is very keen on maintaining so that everyone can benefit from it so that there is no greenwashing. Um, or cause washing, purpose washing, whatever you want to call it um, that goes out there. Um, so uh, again, I just want to flag that. Go ahead. Uh, that link should be in the chat. Um, and at this point, we've got a couple of minutes left. I uh, would just love to pause here, stop the screen share, and solicit feedback that folks have. I'll go ahead and stop the uh, recording as well. Let's 